A couple of weeks ago, I was making homemade ice cream when it uh, occurred to me this is a great new idea for a video. Because making ice cream from liquid cream, or I guess in Dutch it's cookroom, something like that, it's more than just freezing cream, right? Because if you simply freeze this liquid cream, all you get is a rock hard milk popsicle, basically. Nothing that resembles ice cream. So today I wanna to talk about the transformations that occur in cream so that we get the scoopable, delicious dessert we call ice cream. We know we start with cream, but to understand how we convert cream into ice cream, we have to take a much closer look at what we're starting with. And what I mean is we have to really zoom into cream and see what it is on a very tiny scale. And if we could do this, if we had a microscope, you would see that cream has a very special structure that we call an emulsion. And that's because cream has a continuous water phase that surrounds and holds in all these tiny fat globules, all these little spheres of fat. So this is actually a special type of emulsion. We would call this an oil in water emulsion because the fat or oil phase is dispersed as tiny droplets and those droplets are held within a watery continuous phase. So we have a good idea of what we're starting with and what I'm gonna show you today is that there's several transformations that we need to occur in just the right way to make ice cream. And so we're going to talk about the air bubbles, fat globules, and ice crystals. Let's start with talking about air because one of the big differences between cream and ice cream is that ice cream has all these tiny air bubbles incorporated into its structure. And with the ice cream maker that I'm using here, or really any homemade ice cream maker, the air is just slowly folded into the ice cream mix, like you can see here. Uh, if you were manufacturing ice cream, you would use a very different uh, way to add the air. You would probably just directly infuse air into the freezer. So inject a certain amount of air into the ice cream as it's freezing. So it might happen a bit faster. Uh, but like this, this freezer I'm using is pretty uh, simple. So it just slowly adds air. The air will break down into air bubbles because it's uh, being agitated and mixed. Uh, so you hope to get many tiny air cells and you can tell air is being successfully uh, incorporated because the volume will start very small and grow over time as those air bubbles are uh, included in the ice cream structure. So later in the freezing process here, my niece actually figured, figured out I was in the kitchen and checked out what I was doing, but you can see the ice cream has a much larger volume now, and that's really due to all the air that has been slowly incorporated into the structure. Now, the reason we like to include all these tiny air bubbles is it gives a, a very soft texture to the ice cream, or of course, an airy texture to the ice cream but it also breaks up the matrix of the ice cream so that even when it's stored in under freezing conditions, we're able to scoop uh, the ice cream, right? It's not just a uh, frozen cream, like we said earlier, which would be rock hard. It's these air bubbles that can allow us to really have a good scoopability of the ice cream, even if it's stored in your freezer at home. And when it comes to these air bubbles, the best strategy in ice cream is to try and get the smallest air bubbles possible. And the reason you want to start very small is that these air bubbles only grow over time. They get larger over time. And this is due to something called Oswald ripening, which we'll also talk about when we talk about ice crystals. But uh, the theory behind Oswald ripening is if we have very tiny, tiny air bubbles, these have a high surface area and they are less energetically favorable. So what happens over time is these small air cells disappear, but the larger air bubbles grow because these have a less, a lower relative amount of surface area. 
and we call this type of defect coarsening or the air cells get coarser and coarser until they eventually make tunnels or large air gaps in the ice cream. Okay, quick side note here, if you're enjoying this video on ice cream structure, I also have a video on butter structure, which is really interesting because like ice cream, for butter you start with cream, but you basically just shake the crap out of it until cream turns inside out. It is fascinating, check it out. The next transformation, let's talk about forming ice crystals because of course, if we're going to make ice cream, we need ice. And so what happens as we are freezing that liquid cream, once the temperature is low enough, some of the liquid water will transform into ice. It will crystallize. So the one key thing we need to do with the ice is we want them to be very small crystals. We're talking ice crystals, you would probably want them smaller than 50 microns. So they're very tiny. And the reason we want these small ice crystals versus larger ice crystals is the small ones give ice cream this really smooth texture. The problem with large ice crystals, which you uh, probably have eaten if you have an old ice cream or an ice cream that's been very freezer burned, these large ice crystals make the ice cream, uh, it, it's not smooth anymore, right? You don't enjoy it as much. And I would say there's two really important factors you want to control. The first is you want to freeze ice cream at a very, very cold temperature, which that's probably obvious. But secondly, you want to make sure you have that dasher going around and scraping everything as you're making ice cream. And even in this homemade ice cream maker that I'm using, you can see it has a plastic dasher constantly going around and that dasher is scraping the sides of the ice cream machine, which are the coldest parts. So that's where we expect the ice crystals to start forming. And before they're allowed to grow too large, the dasher should be coming around again and scraping those ice crystals off. And this gives us many tiny crystals, which gives us a smooth texture, instead of just a couple really large crystals, which you're going to feel in your mouth as you ate that ice cream. So one of the goals of this freezing step is you want to start with the tiniest ice crystals possible, because as ice cream sits in a freezer or in your home, the ice crystals are only going to get bigger. And this again is due to that Oswald ripening. So just like we talked about with the air bubbles growing in size, we see the same thing happen for ice crystals. And what that means is we start with small crystals, but what happens as we store ice cream is we see those small ice crystals disappear while the large ice crystals grow in size. And a quick reminder here, if you're enjoying this video, please press that thumbs up button so that it gets shared with more people. All right, now let's move on to the fat, which you may have heard me referring to as fat globules, which just means all the fat in ice cream or in cream is actually broken up into these tiny, tiny little spheres of fat. So they're like little globules, you would call them. And now what happens to fat in ice cream actually has a very special place in my heart because this is what I studied during my PhD. So my PhD dissertation is actually on what happens to fat during things like making ice cream and whipped topping. Now what we need these fat globules to do is undergo something called partial coalescence or you might also hear it be called arrested coalescence. But all these terms mean is that fat globules, they contact one another, but they don't merge into one larger globule. Instead, they just merge a teeny tiny bit. And once this happens hundreds or thousands of times, this actually makes a huge fat network throughout the entire ice cream. So you have thousands of these fat globules all partially connected and it runs just makes this 3D matrix throughout the ice cream structure. And what is really important is we need these fat globules, globules to partially coalesce 
because it's the structure that uh, helps ice cream to stand up against gravity. And this fat network is actually so strong that even once all the ice crystal melts back to liquid water, often the fat network can still uh, allow the ice cream to stand up and it prevents just a rapid collapse of the structure or quickly melting. So typically in ice creams that have a lot of partial coalescence, high level of partial coalescence, they melt much slower than ice cream that has very little partial coalescence. So by controlling what those fat globules do in the ice cream, you can actually control the meltdown rate of your ice cream, which is a pretty useful thing. Now getting these fat globules to partially coalesce is a bit of a complex phenomenon. That's why I spent many years studying it. But what you need is actually a mix of liquid and solid fat. So within each of these little globules or spheres, what you'd see is that some of the fat is crystal or solid and another part of that globule has liquid fat. And it's really this uh, amount of liquid fat that allows the droplets to start merging and partially coalesce, but the solid fat inside stops the droplets from just merging into one larger spherical globule. So you need both liquid and solid fat to get this partially coalesced fat network, which gives the ice cream the uh, strength to not melt down immediately. And also fat in foods lends uh, what you consider creaminess, a creamy mouthfeel when you eat food. So fat is important for actually quite a few reasons. If you are wondering what holds in these air bubbles, fat globules and ice crystals, well, that is another part of ice cream we haven't talked about yet. And this last part we call the syrup phase, or it's basically an unfrozen liquid phase. So not everything in ice cream actually freezes. And it is these, this liquid phase that tends to surround all the other uh, parts, the fat globules, the crystals, everything we talked about. So let me know if you enjoyed this dive into food structure. And if there's any foods you are curious about, please leave a comment and that could be my next video. All right, I'll talk to you next time. Bye.